<laughs> Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and this is the web's talk show about Gnosticism, ancient Gnostics, Gnosis, mysticism, esotericism, the connections between art and mysticism, comic books, whatever else we feel like talking about. I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Memo. Hello, Jason. Hello there. And we have an extremely on-brand show for you today. Uh, we are interviewing the uh, creators, the editors, publishers behind Aeonic Comics, a new publication uh, that is uh, graphical arts and comic art related to the esoteric. But they're going to explain it a lot better than I can as we get into this uh, interview. Hello, Aeonic team. Thank you for joining us. Hey, it's good to be here. Hello. So, before we get started, I unfortunately do have to do our commercial at the top of the show, but for both the guests' sake and the listeners' and viewers' sake, uh, what Jason and I have been trying to do lately is see how fast I can do it. The record is 38 seconds. That's actually the first time I did it. I haven't been able to beat it since. Uh, Jason, uh, are you ready at the timer? I am ready to go. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Talk Gnosis is brought to you by viewers and listeners like you, and we need your financial help to keep doing the show. You can go to patreon.com slash Gnostic and donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can also put a cap on that if you're worried about us making too much media. You can also do one-time <laughs> donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. If you're unable to help us out financially, we understand these are crazy times, so always be crazy times. We've been there ourselves. You can also help us out by sharing the show on social media, telling your friends about it, uh, emailing your favorite episode to your friends, uh, liking and subscribing, leaving good reviews on the pile catcher of your choice <sighs> how'd i do very good uh, 34 seconds yeah new record <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> okay well now we can uh, actually uh, talk about what we're here to talk about uh a on a comics. All, all those, all those uh, who, what, where, why questions at the top of the show. C can you tell us a little bit about yourselves, like, and, and what's your interest and in work with the occult and esoteric? And then how did you two meet and, and decide to collaborate in this way? Actually, we met through comics, which is kind of funny. Um, we've been dating for quite a while now, but we were introduced by a friend of ours who likes to go by the name Spaghetti Jesus, who's actually featured in um, the new issue. But he introduced us because he had a script that he wanted to turn into a comic and he wanted me to illustrate it. So we actually met that way. Um, and it's just been a uh, road from there. I think perhaps part of it as well is that we were both kind of um, interested in outside comics comics mm -hmm. that are not just like superhero stuff underground um, comics heavy metal stuff and the more experimental variety even the very first project we were going to do together was focused on occultism so the relationship not just romantically but artistically uh has its root there Okay. And and with the occult, are you both, like, what is both of your relationship to it? Are, are you practitioners? Uh, uh, are you artists who are interested by it? Are you all of the above? Or can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your relationship is with, with the occult and with the mystic and, and how you both got into that? I always like hearing these origin stories, right, of following the breadcrumbs and, and coming into this stuff. You want to start with that? Sure. So... Uh, this is one that I, I've told before, like music, music was the origin for me. It mm. was through David Bowie, actually, that I got interested in occultism because he, he talks about Aleister Crowley, the Golden Dawn. He, he draws the Kabbalah on uh, station to station. And I was very obsessed with Bowie in my youth. So it kind of started there, I would say. At least that was uh, that was for me. For me, I was always fascinated and going through as a kid old books in the library. And one of my favorite things is when you would find a section that had like the paranormal books about um, aliens, UFOs, books on religion, and really absorbing the art in that way. And I had a very active imagination as a kid. And I was actually I was raised uh, Christian through the whole rigmarole of that but I really wasn't it wasn't backed up by my family 
So I kind of filled in the gaps with my own imagination. It was really fascinated in how religions worked and the structure of them. And I think that I internalized that in my own art. So as I got older, I became more interested in the sort of more esoteric side of things and started to explore that. And um, personally, I'm very big into the work of people like Austin Osmond Spare and William Blake, especially. So I'm very fascinated in the meeting of um, visionary experience and artwork. Yeah. Yeah, extremely cool. And uh, we particularly love hearing uh, stories. Uh, it's about coming to it through art, which which both of you did. And uh, and I think that's probably similar to, to Jason and I, many of the guests that we speak to, a lot of people that we know. And a, a lot of the time it's not deliberate, but because it's such a powerful interest of ours, this connection between whatever art is and whatever the esoteric is and whatever imagination is and whatever the divine is, keeps bubbling up on the show. And uh, people can tell when I'm going through phases because I'll book, you know, 10 guests in a row without realizing it, you know, kind of on the topic. So, hey, patrons, I hope you enjoy uh, these 10 shows. <laughs> um, Aonic team, uh, tell us about Aonic Comics. How did it come to be? And what are you trying to, quote unquote, to do with this project? I remember that we wanted to consolidate the comic work that we did together. And I think we had several different names for it before settling yeah. on Aonic. And because we, we had done books together before. I think Black Sun was before Ionic. Mm -hmm. and I was doing a lot of dream comics at the time, too, but they didn't really have a home. And Instagram, when you throw your stuff up there, it's like, oh, cool, neat. And then people just scroll on by. It doesn't really have that sticking power. So we wanted to have something that we could show our own work, but then also open the door for other people's work that we both really enjoyed to get that out there and really have a physical uh, representation of it. That was so much later. We initially were doing just ourselves for a while. Yeah, it did it, take a little but while. But I think the, the move toward it being collective was very important because um, that's really what I found, you know, over the course of running meme analysis, that there were a lot of people who were hearing things that they had really longed for. And so it attracted a lot of artists that were like-minded, that were interested in the same sorts of things. So the fact that we had many artists that were also interested in what we did, mm -hmm. I think, was what kind of allowed for it to be what it is. And as for the relation to the occult specifically, even in the very beginning, we had cast the I Ching on the venture. And it was it was the first hexagram, which is heaven. And it so it was a very uh very auspicious indeed. <laughs> exactly. It was a very auspicious reading. So we've kind of had a a confidence in it from the beginning. I think especially too, since we met in comics, mm -hmm. I think that that's always been a very important art form to us. And then also another idea we had too, we had an idea of um, tragic comics. Mm -hmm. And so it would be comic books that weren't just something like the superhero kind of stuff that everybody's used to, but something that really gets the heart of the power of words and sequential images, because we were talking about how if you think about things like Stations of the Cross or old medieval manuscripts and things of that nature, those are kind of comics in a way, or the work of William Blake. So we really wanted to try to expand the media to get it back to its roots in that way of the power of words and images and what that can do. Um, so that's been a very important part of the project. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'd actually, and, and Taro, I'd put on that list too, right? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, there's definitely a, a long, important uh, heritage of that uh, um, I feel like within. Uh, Taro would be a, a kind of a fractal comics in a way. Yeah. yeah. Which some, some are meant to be read as, you know, there are there are comics that are like constantly, constantly shifting and breaking down. And I think mm -hmm. that's another, like something that we were interested in as well is just, um, that breaking down of form 
One of my friends described tarot as like one of the most advanced technologies, the deck of cards, because of that non-linear progression. The same with the I Ching. And that is kind of the potential for sequential art, for comics that I that we feel is just not being achieved as much as it could. I think it was mm -hmm. Levi too that said that if he was in prison, all he would need is a deck of tarot cards because you have every story you could ever make right there. And um, mm. yeah, we found that to be very true. Yeah, yeah. probably another predecessor too. Uh, uh, if you mentioned it, alchemical texts, right? With yeah. which, which, which are much more, I think, um, sequential art or comic books as we had recognize yeah. them because of the combination of of images and words. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it is really interesting that that this is uh, you know we got we got a couple thousand years of, of this. <laughs> um, Jason, but before I barrel on, do you have uh, uh, questions, follow up questions, comments, what have you? Um, I'm just trying to to uh, uh, well, you know, actually, I think some of these questions might actually do better near the end. So, but it's kind of connected to some of the notes you guys were saying about um, just your own backgrounds, but also uh, having met through comics. So. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll I'll keep a pin in this in this question and come but come back to it later. Yeah, well, you know, my next question we basically just talked about, but I, you know, if we could go even deeper in it, which is why primarily comics and graphic art? I know we just talked about that for five minutes, but can you go even deeper on that for me? <laughs> um, just with specifically, I, I think uh, you know people are are getting into graphic novels they have for a long time. All the mainstream media has uh, biff bam pow; they're not for kids anymore. Is it your personal relationship and your love of the medium and the recognition of its? Uh, occult potential or just yeah, more if you can i think honestly beyond music that comics and sequential art in general are the divine medium mm. it was a theme throughout jung when i was reading him that i was amazed by the power of bright colors on the unconscious mind the power of images and not of too many words but of phrases of ideas reduced to um kind of a caption i think the comic is infinitely more powerful than the book than the painting alone they are capable of communicating some of the most vital stories because they evoke not just word but image in unison it i think that also one of the things that comics do that movies and things that have a combination of visual sound and motion don't do is that comics require you in part to bring that to life more and i think there's more of a gray area for interpretation also from a creator's perspective, um, there's a quote, I think it actually came from Maurice Sendak who did uh, the illustrations and did Where the Wild Things Are, but he said that one of the reasons that he loved children's books is because the media was simple enough that you could crawl into it and let your entire self explode into it. And I think comic books are similar where at least with movies, you kind of by nature have to have more of a connection to people and a team to really make something that really gets big things across. It can be simplified, but it's more difficult. Comics, however, it's just you, the paper, the media, and whatever thing you're kind of trying to bring out of the ether. Um, so I think like there's more of a direct connection that the creator can immediately get by doing comics as opposed to media that just takes more energy to produce. Yeah. And uh, why why an actual physical publication? Why not do it as an online magazine, as a web, uh, as a website, as a web comic, or one of the other sort of many uh, online media options that you could have gone with? If, I, if you don't mind me speaking candidly, at least mm -hmm. for me personally, so it gets read. Um, because I think like for short term things, people uh, will read comics online, but for a whole um, volume, it's like, oh cool, I downloaded this PDF. But I feel like a lot of that stuff gets lost in um, translation. And when I was in high school, for example, um, 
in when I was there, we switched our high school newspaper from print to digital and nobody read it. So I think like from a purely practical standpoint, it was just so it's something that people can ignore less because there's something like you physically have to buy this. You can open it, you read it, you have it, it's there. Um, and then also the sense of having a physical product of that art, I think is important. Um, the digital is very important too, not to take away from that. Um, we focus a lot on that in the magazine, um, but we definitely want it to be a primarily physical book. It's a question of occult influence as well. Um, I think the, the problem is one of how to influence most effectively. And I've gotten my YouTube channel fairly popular um, and it's through visual means, through mimetics. But when one does art, it's very difficult to popularize art. And especially in a, in a time like this, when it is, it is an endless scroll, any one piece of art is reduced to, you know, waste. It, it's meaningless. What I am interested in is the absolute significance of a piece of art. I, I can't stand making something that goes unseen, unwatched, and uncared for. Um, you know, to me, it is the duty of the artist to ensure the influential nature of the piece. And we see that in physicality. Um, physicality, it, it's much more difficult to ignore. Mm -hmm. So it is vital for any publication, I think, to be physical if it wishes to influence the reader. Even if it gets less readers, because it's harder to get, it will influence those readers far more. And that is what really counts. We actually have rituals now that we're including with the magazine that require you to have it as well for I feel like it to be fully effective. And I think that in that regard, it gets to a person in a much more powerful way that way when it's physical. Another uh, another note too on um, making art for the internet, I feel like a lot of younger people too, when they're making art just to post online, it they sort of don't tap into their own creative potential as much because they're making it for Instagram or for something like that. So I think it's important to avoid. Yeah. And if you don't um, mind me saying, perhaps this is the difference between an artist and the duty of an artist and being a content creator. Does, does, does that ring? <laughs> does that ring true? Um, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, Jason, you had something. Oh, uh, well, actually, I'd love to hear their answer. And then I have a question. OK. <laughs> yeah. Content creator versus artist, if there is or if there is a versus. I think I have done my best to synthesize the two. Yeah. Um, in part by using the wasteful nature of content creation to express artistry. Um, and it's a question I ask constantly, like why, why do we allow the most popular um, figures online to be so stupid and wasteful. <laughs> Why do we not have greater artistry at the top? Um, and I really don't, I really think it's, it's a shame. And, you know, I don't foresee my channel being a major one, but I hope that it can influence those who want to do that to make more artistic, but popular uh, content. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, oh. Ahead, yeah, no, just to, to dive into some of that earlier stuff you guys were talking about regarding the, the, the physicality and the intentionality, like, uh, that's just speaking to me, I just, just this is not even a question, just me riffing, but like, as, uh, as like, I've, I've made a few small comics myself, uh, uh, just as a writer with a bunch of artist friends, but like, um, I know, I know with may, way more certainty that the people who have, uh, um, picked up a copy from me at a convention have probably read those stories versus uh, like I, the comic is for free online. It's just, I think you could, it's on my website. It's all like all that kind of stuff, but like the amount of visitors to that site versus people who've actually read it, you know, um, 
And also, like, there's even there's a bunch of web comics that I love that are not like disposable. They're not just like, uh, you know, video game gag web comics. Which I mean, that's that's fine, but it's also it's meant to be content created very quickly. Um, like, there's really good deep stuff out there that I keep meaning to read. But but again, there's like sort of that digital space creates a space for it to be to be done later, if that makes sense. Uh, versus holding a copy in my hand, I'll sit down and read that. Um, and then, uh, so this is just me agreeing with you guys on, on, I think, such a great approach. And then the other thing about the ritual uh, that needed to be done physically, that actually kind of reminded me, did you hear about uh, how the last issue of Promethea needed to be actually taken apart? No, that's really um, cool. Yeah, so you actually had to uh, take the staples out um, and then uh, reassemble the pages in a different order based on numbers that were on the pages that aren't didn't connect to, their, to the, the bound order. So you create a whole new image just based on, on whole, like on uh, uh, destroying your comic, essentially, um, which was part of a Alan Moore's magical process. So that's mm -hmm. a, yeah. Anyway, I'm just riffing because I think there's some really neat stuff, re neat connections to be made there. Yeah, Moore um, Moore is really one of the figures who is working to you know who is working to make comics greater mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and a more significant medium. We both we're both big fans of Moore, um, Neil Neil Gaiman. I don't like Neil Moore, so, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> but but Neil Neil Gaiman definitely. We uh, okay. we like Grant Morrison, but uh, I, I think people have picked up that uh, we are we have some issues with him. So, <laughs> um, uh, and of course, he famously though had included a ritual for uh, Invisibles, um, which uh, if we can't get our numbers up at uh, Talk Gnosis, perhaps we'll also do that ritual. Um, okay, <laughs> what? <laughs> Aona Comics, what is what is your vision for the future of Aona Comics? One of the things we actually might want to incorporate is to actually include animations too with the stuff that we are doing online that's not just physical. Um, we'd like to make short animations too, because that's another media that I think very strongly people haven't explored the potential of yet. Uh, I agree. I think it's maybe one of the best mediums for exploring uh, 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 the unconscious and surrealism and occultism and dream logic. Um, uh, but sorry, uh, yeah, so future. To, to go back to the uh, uh, the DIY, uh, or not the DIY, but the, the, the physicality thing, is imagine making a, uh, a comic that turns into a flipbook. So you've got actual yeah. animation, animation crossed with this like really clear analog experience. That was something I always quite enjoyed. There were comics, I recall, um, when I was a kid, they had things um, by the page number that would move. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I remember so that, that it could flip just the corner. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, yeah, cool. you know, the, um, and the same for things like audio. Like, I am interested in lathing my own records, making my own tapes and such. Like, mm. the return to the physical medium, I think, is not... It's not going to work through it being kitsch and retro, which is what it seems to be now, but rather it's going to be through a magical form. Mm. <laughs> what, what you see in a lot of the work of like Leary and Wilson, um, and just a lot of people writing in the 90s that had this hope for the internet, they really foresaw a spiritual internet and I think that we've been gravely mm. disappointed. Um, you know, we were promised a heavenly internet, and I think it's without a doubt a hellish internet. You know, the vision <laughs> yes. of being a collective library, of being a collective fantasy, uh, it's certainly not. It's in information being restricted and desires being perverted rather than uh, uh, unleashed. So I think that the, the disappointment of the internet will lead to a far greater and more meaningful but rarer physicality which is what you know our magazine aims to be mm -hmm. yeah and to clarify so so you're you're uh, the two of you are the uh the editors you're the publishers uh but you also have uh pieces and art design within the magazine itself right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 
And can you tell us a little bit more about the content of uh, right now? You're up to two issues at at, at the time of recording. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what's in there, or some of the contributors, or really anything at all, so that people can know what they're getting into when they when they hit uh, uh, the link and order? Um, we have a lot of comics. Uh, the first one, actually, somebody did a very interesting comic, Sean Pryor, that was a section from um, Levi that was put into a comic format. I have a continuous story called The Last Saint that's about the shift from the old Aeon into the new. Um, so we have some continuing stories, not so much yet. A lot of it's self-contained within the issues, but we are looking to get more continuing stories as well. We have a lot of written pieces as well too. Um, there's some very interesting experimental writing in the second issue too that we're both really excited about. Um, and then also a lot of illustration work as well. Uh, I just put in a tarot card that you, like you were talking about, um, cutting up the book. You have a card that you cut out just as there is ritual in the book. Um, I, hopefully I think we can, we can progress and play with and experiment with the book form itself. That's amazing. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it's exciting. I'm really excited about the uh, the future. Yeah, there's there's just so many things more possible when dealing with with physicality and. Um, and of course, you, Jason and I are both Gnostics, and I think there's also a lot in esotericism uh, about just incarnating, right? <laughs> you are pulling down and incarnating, which is, uh, you know, kind of literally what, what you folks are doing with this project, right? Pulling out from the self, incarnating. Um, what has been the response so far to Aeonic Comics? I know at, at the time of recording, just the first issue is out, and the second issue is, is shipping now. Is, is that right? But what's mm -hmm. the response been so far? Pretty good, I would say. I think that um, both the audiences that we have, and especially he has online, um, have been really responsive to it. And then also, I think the splash that it's made from festivals that we sold at and conventions has been very good, too. There was a convention I was at, actually, where somebody picked up a copy and they're like, oh, man, I just got chills. I could tell this is like really something different. And uh, that was right after the first one came out. That was actually the first physical event I was able to do with it after everything kind of started coming back again. And uh, when I heard that, I was like, okay, good. This is uh, definitely going in the right direction. It's definitely really rewarding to see the reactions people have to it. Uh, something that I've found is that, you know, much of, much of the meme analysis work is pointing out problems and things. And a lot of the people who watch my channel were like desperate for um, answers, for solutions. And I feel Aeonic in many ways presents praxis mm -hmm. in that it is not just a critique of the old, but a creation and example for hopefully what is to come. You know, we call it Aeonic Comics because, you know, we're, we're aiming toward the new Aeon a lot because uh, one of the, the problem that I got at in my essay on, tra uh, on tragic books, the idea that you could have tragic books instead of comic books, is that the comic book as it stands, the superhero comic is hopelessly lost in an old world morality and that there were really no comics of the new Aeon, which is to say that there were no eternal books. There was nothing that was going to make it through that was being made right now. And while we are not that, you know, proud, we're not going, we're not saying like it's our stories that are going to make it, but rather the idea is that in this magazine that there could be an artist who tells an eternal story that couldn't be told elsewhere. I kind of look at it as we're in the beginning of the new Aeon, and it's sort of like the beginning of the last, where there's all these things going on in the desert, all these things that could be forming, these like stories of Jin in the desert, and then eventually it solidifies into what will become the story of the new Aeon. So we're not going to be around to see whatever's coming next, but we want to foster people to throw as many things as they can at the board and 
whatever takes off will become what needs to happen. Yeah. Well, that leads quite well to, to my next question. If we're talking about the creating something for all ages, something eternal, uh, something that is not responsive to the old Aeon, which is this occultism stuff. It, it presently seems to be pretty trendy, pretty in. Uh, is, is this just a fad? And why is it kind of in and cool? And why does it seem to be attracting more people than ever? I think that people desperately feel like they need something greater. And I think that the occult one, I think, aesthetically has a lot to offer in that way. And I think that it's a response to a lot of the confusion and deconstruction of what we have just gone through. Um, I do think that if you get into things like witch talk and what the kids like to do now, there's definitely, I think, a lot of a marketability thing. It's sort of, it's more of like, a capital kind of lean, but I think at the heart of it, there is definitely a desire that's being expressed. So I think it's beyond just a trend. Well, with the story that you were describing with the jinn and desert predicating um, the coming of Allah, the coming of a single God, you know, though I am an occultist, I am not sentimental. And I recognize that the majority of popular occultism will be a sham entirely but a necessary one to lead to the production of a true one. Mm -hmm. So while much of it is a trend, it will produce the thing that is eternal. And that, you know, one of the really basic alchemical truths, right? You know, turning, turning dirt or shit into gold. Um, we have to accept yeah. the nonsense of popular occultism to get anything worthwhile. I think that's the big thing that a lot of people who talk about it online tend to shy away from because of course it's a topic that if you were to go out on the street uh, a lot of people would be kind of hesitant to go into it so i think that by nature a lot of people when they approach it online they like they don't want to deal with a lot of the dirty stuff especially a lot of the dirty stuff on the internet which is why i think meme analysis is so great because it's like there are things that are being expressed threads here of information and it deserves to be recognized just because uh something seems strange and new doesn't mean that there's not something valuable in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Jason, I, I'm almost at the end of, of my secret question sheet. Um, do you <laughs> do you have, uh, you mentioned you might have some questions for, for close to the end or things that were percolating? Yeah, uh, well, even before we get right to that spot, um, uh, I guess, uh, so like in terms of, of directions to go in the like in the future, one of the, one of the things like we we even talked earlier about like superhero stuff like are the more mainstream comics versus an indie comics uh, uh, world, and that's like I'm definitely getting the indie vibe from a lot of what I'm seeing from Aeonic, um, and so I guess is the uh, and also because you are bringing a lot of um, a lot of different artists together, like uh, is there as kind of a community building quality here, like a um, mm -hmm. you know sort of Aeonic alum that <laughs> that have that are now yeah. part of the book. We've definitely had people that have come back for the second issue, and I think that are going to be a part of our core team for the future, too. Um, right now, we're planning it for it to be a quarterly publication, but I, I definitely think that um, we're trying to get a community, community of people who are going to continue to add to the magazine as it sort of solidifies in its own right, which mm -hmm. is pretty exciting. And it certainly really is. Cool. Oh, sorry. It certainly is in the formation of communities like this that we can get at. Like, what are the threads that all of these people submitting are getting at? Yeah. And what what are the threads in Aeonic itself? We were talking about how we want to uh, paint a picture of like the average Aeonic reader. That's mm. like trying to figure that out. <laughs> I mean, at least two of them are on the call with you right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Uh, so they clearly wear glasses. Um, yeah. Middle-aged <laughs> yeah, Libras. Yeah, yeah middle-aged yeah. Libras. Um, we do have the, quite a few Libras. <laughs> the, <laughs> the other thing I was going to say about community, uh, indie, there was a, oh shoot. Oh yeah, so uh, uh, you mentioned about it being a quarterly book. Um, that's, I mean, that's actually in a way I'm, I'm, I'm impressed to just to hear that because even that kind of serialized work 
can be it can be a bit of a grind. Um, yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, in like, design. <laughs> in design, running to the printers. Oh man, I've been there. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess maybe two questions. What's your current model now? Like, is it kind of are, are you guys kind of banking your own stuff into it and then hoping to make it back in sales? Or do you have kind of like a print on demand thing going? Um, We've like, been experimenting with trying to find a print on demand service. That's that would specifically be helpful for um, overseas sales. I think uh, mm -hmm. I had to ship a comic out to Lithuania. Uh, that I think is the <laughs> farthest point we've gotten, which I never thought I'd have to do that. But uh, yeah, that was really cool. But um, definitely a learning curve with that. So we're kind of still weighing our options. Um, I really like the printer we have now, but we definitely want to expand because we want to get as many orders as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, right now it's kind of a homegrown operation sort of thing, but we want it to be as efficient as possible. I think one of the things we've thought about doing is having it print on demand, but then having um, our own printed copies that have something special. Like yeah. If you mm -hmm. buy it in real life, this is this is a different, you know, you might get a, a kind of thing with it. Like some comics oh. used to have toys and gum and stuff. Like yeah. we would give, we'll have give a little, exactly, give a little additional like that. thing because yeah. we want to reward just being outside. Yeah. <laughs> like, Positive reinforcement. Exactly. Stay, keep yeah, yeah, coming out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then so that going, going back to that, that quarterly uh, uh, process, is it, do you sort of see it quarterly indefinitely, like or as long as there's a community and as long as there's there's art that feels like it needs to be made, or is there like is there a kind of an endpoint that you're imagining? Uh, I think we're going to keep it for quarterly right now. I think very briefly we touched upon maybe having spin-off issues for more of the poetry submissions because we get a lot of poetry, but we don't really have a lot of the space for it. So mm -hmm. sometimes we talk about doing short runs of things like that, or maybe expanding the name to do other more specific things, which kind of goes into the animation stuff as well. Um, but for right now, I think it's quarterly. And as far as a limit to the end of it, I don't really think we have a limit to the end. I think it's just when uh, either we collapse or it grows <laughs> into whatever it needs to be. Um, but yeah. OK. Cool. Um, and uh, uh, so in the in the in-person experiences that you've had, have you found any interesting, like I, we talked near the beginning about the idea of the connection being like that you, you're selling it to somebody in person, you have a stronger sense that they're actually going to read it. Um, have you had any of a, like any responses out in the wild that you've been yes. like, oh, wow. Huh? Um, actually, there was a really cool um, written portion for the first one called Star Seeds from um, a writer that he's friends with and that default I'm a friend. default friend that we're um, both a fan of. Oh. Yeah. And past, um, past guest the, is on the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Default friend of the show. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> and um, we were at a concert and somebody had uh, bought the magazine from us and they read that story and they came back to us and they're like, I am a star seed. And we got into this whole conversation about it. and. Um, that was that was really something. I think uh, that would really hit a chord with her. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Um, uh, oh uh, yeah, so I, I'm working my way through my questions here. This one's so I was looking through the Ayana Comics uh, website and just looking at the like the the people, the artists involved, and um, uh, it says Hunter Biden did a piece <laughs> for this. We yeah. we cannot explain too thoroughly, but. Let me let me say that our, our connections to the kind of dime square red scare scene are are not limited solely to the artists. There we go. <laughs> Amazing. That Amazing. Is a, that is a great answer, yeah. and I think yeah. something that will uh, uh, hopefully prompt people to buy a copy because I want to know more. <laughs> um, and then I think like this is kind of my sort of this is the question I've been kind of hanging on to, um, uh, is that so like the you've all you kind of talked previously about uh, some of the other artists and, and inspirations that you've uh, that you've had, but specifically from an indie comics background, and especially since you as you said you both met through comics, 
Um, uh, if you can maybe just mention any particular sources of inspiration, uh, either from back then or maybe even something that you've discovered recently that like has been, has reinvigorated or con continued an invigorating response to comics and to especially to occult comics. Personally, um, I think at the core, William Blake has just been a huge inspiration to me as an artist in general. Um, and then, of course, I was always into the underground comic scene as well. Um, mm -hmm. And more recently, I think just being um, seeing a lot of great art online and being fed up with how it wasn't flourishing. What would you say? Mm -hmm. yeah, Benny? I think a lot, like you said, I think Blake was fascinated by religious depictions. Um, and I would say one of the other things that I think led to it was our, our interest, not just in traditional occultism, but in UFOs, mm -hmm. in cryptids. And we, we kind of agreed like that is new Aeon art. Um, mm. I, when, I, when I was very young, I would read these UFO books and the imagery itself was so extremely frightening. And the stories frightened me just so immensely, like I, I, uh, I couldn't sleep. And that art had a really serious effect on me. And so I think, you know, the aiming toward new Aeon art, like, you know, who's a great example of, <laughs> of that? Like, you know, I'm a big fan of Jack Kirby, but one of the influences on Kirby yes. might be even more important, uh, Richard Shaver. Like you want new A on art, you you look at his rock paintings. I mean, the man was a prolific, a prolific writer. However mad he he, you know, cut thousands and thousands of rocks and saw imagery within them. You know, he he was an artist depicting what was true, and I think mm. cryptid art always does that. Outsider art has been a huge influence mm. on. I think the experiences of that and then taking it seriously too outside of a clinical perspective I think is very important that goes in tandem with um, UFO experiences and UFO encounters we have um, a couple of local artists even in uh, I think Hoboken that are famous for doing depictions of their own experiences with these things and I think that the patterns and meaning of these stories need to be explored and the visual art is a very good way to do that mm -hmm. yeah exactly um, uh i'm glad you mentioned outsider art because i was literally just thinking about uh so a couple of <laughs> shout outs to other episodes that john and i've worked, worked on together we talked about william blake uh, a couple of episodes ago and um we also interviewed jim woodring uh oh, for... I, love him. <laughs> I, I was like i was totally gushing i'm like oh my god it's so exciting yeah. to talk to me right now um uh, but we also talked specifically. He was illustrating a book called *Voyage to Arcturus* by David Lindsay, I think the guy's name is, and that, that is like outsider art at its finest. Like it's completely weird. Apparently, sold 200 copies when he was alive, and then he died immediately afterwards. Um, it's nuts. But the way I'm going to link all this back together is that we are talk gnosis, and we actually haven't talked about gnosticism a lot in this episode here. Um, but I am like uh, maybe what I'll pause it and see if the, if uh, everybody, including John, can kind of jump in on this is uh, is uh, the, the particularly outsider art, uh, especially like this new aeonic art of like cryptids, UFO experiences, um, this like the, the notion of the eerie, the like I'm, I'm thinking of like podcasts like the Magnus Archives or Lore or things like that, which are like not quite just ghost stories, but uh, em embracing this sense of a sublime weirdness. Um, how that connects to, I think, oh, um, uh, how that, I think, maybe connects to, I think, what a lot of Gnostics are, are kind of trying to reconcile, which is a world that doesn't quite seem to fit, yet a kind of beauty that still some, seems to be experienced in it. Because um, that's often the Gnostic question of, like, why is the world so weird? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just riffing that out as an idea. Maybe, John, if you want to run with it a little more, and then if the Aeonic team can also kind of see, see their own connections. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and of course, I, I've got to think of uh, Bishop Alan Greenfield. If you're looking for somebody whose Gnosticism in, in many ways is perhaps different from, from Jason and I's and within the movements we're connected to, but at the same time has some very strong connections to, to those movements, um, uh, both personally and in beliefs. And uh, he's a very interesting person who does bring in the UFOs, the Shaver mystery, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Kentucky Goblins, <laughs> um, all of that into Gnosticism. Right, which which is which is something I'm not brave enough to do because I want to have a serious religion for serious people, um, and <laughs> and I wish that I I I wish I had his his bravery, right? But he, he does see them interconnected, and and I think that's just it, Jason. It 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 is that idea of those those other worlds breaking in. In it is those ideas of incarnation it is the it is also these ideas of like okay when you look at stuff like ufos and goblins and, and all these different things how do you fit it into specifically ancient sepian gnosticism right and you do that by when you look at the classic gnostical myths the universe um and i'm, I'm going to say the universe and not the cosmos right cosmos beautiful perfect the universe is all effed up from, from the bottom of the level to the top of the level. It's all mixed up, it's all confused. Order is uh, interrelated with chaos. This is what the Gnostic myths tell us, right? Um, so when we're trying to slot this stuff in to systems that make sense, it is actually very Gnostic because it says, well, no, you know, you're not going to be able to make sense of this. And yes, you know, the, the, the Shaver um, uh, underground people and the UFOs are not in ancient Gnostic texts, but because they're, the ancient Gnostic texts are telling you all bets are off, um, it, and that there isn't this this cosmos that makes sense. Um, then uh, it opens the door to all that stuff. Does any of the talking about making sense? Any of that make sense, Jason? You, you know oh, what I'm yeah. trying to say specifically for what Gnosticism has to say, as opposed to I mean, there's lots of systems that say the universe doesn't make sense, but specifically Gnosticism, right? It leaves yeah. all these doors open, um, and, well, and you can fit all this stuff in. Um, and I mean, just to run with that even a bit further, and we'll let the guests talk in just a second, because we should, <laughs> but like, because <laughs> um, uh, the, that's the other part of all this Gnosticism is that like, it's not just that the world is weird and why, but also Gnosis happens, these moments of, yeah. of, of like light break through, you know, uh, what's the like Leonard Cohen line, um, cracks are how the lights get, light gets in, something like that. It's um, the ones that cracked that the light shines through, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and it, like it's a par it's a yeah, it's a paraphrase of a Sufi quote. So there's all sorts of different versions of it. But that yeah. that's right, Jason. That yeah, kind of, that's and that like it's in. and that the kind of art we're talking about and the kind of art that Aonic is making um, is are like places where the light shines through in a way, like because it's cracking through the the weirdness by like sort of also living in the weirdness, experiencing the weirdness. Um, again, totally riffing, and again, maybe like the guests would have something to say about this rather than us talking at them. Yeah. <laughs> The time is out of joint, and you know there's more to heaven and earth than our philosophies can dream of. I think that that is the philosophy that we must approach the paranormal and the weird with. We have to recognize it as not not hallucination, not fiction, but as that that glimpse at the beyond, that glimpse at divinity. Um, you know, one of the projects that we're actually just getting started with is a, a kind of cryptid tarot, mm. a mm. tarot of the paranormal. Mm. Because, you know, I, I don't just analyze memes. I'm, I'm really, really fascinated with high strangeness, with that mm. sublime weirdness. I think that there is a, an order to it and that occultism provides the best the best lens with which we can perceive it and you know speaking as to these kind of these strange beings as divine ones i think that you know we get no better look at the elementals of classical occultism than in paranormal phenomena mm -hmm. and it's very it's very significant and i think when, you know, when we first, we had an Aeonic cast for like one episode, but yeah. I think it's better to keep it visual. Yeah. But, you know, the art of the new Aeon is undoubtedly strange, mm -hmm. weird in a very true way. The way that like mm -hmm. we were talking about Shaver, the way that Shaver was truly weird, the way that outsider artists and Blake are truly weird. 
uh, not this kind of nonsense, not a nonsense, but you know, a greater sense. Mm -hmm. And also something that I think people can imagine experiencing more. I think that the, if you want to call them cultural memes or something like that of aliens, I think people can kind of, they can imagine meeting an alien far more than I think the layman can imagine meeting an angel these days, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that's important too, is that this is something that's, it's, it's you can experience it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Folklorists and, and many others have, of course, have long noticed that the, the alien experience, uh, the alien abduction experience, the alien encounter is near identical to what was, you know, previously said to be often fairies, actually, but lots of other supernatural beings. Um, so it, it actually does sort of slot in exactly with the rest of this occult stuff in, in, a, in a much more specific way, uh, not in a general way. Yeah. Um. Uh, just riffing on that a bit, is that like my partner and I were talking about how the movie Interstellar can be perceived as a fairy story if you consider the fact that there's a fairy ring and a sense of lost time um, yeah. uh, and wisdom that you approach through different methods and stuff. So um, anyway, we'll save that for a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's just so much fun to riff on this kind of stuff. And you guys are, are, are wonderful to riff with because you have such cool ideas. Yeah, this um, is a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that does, those sound like wrap-up words, unfortunately. Uh, I've been flowing, uh, throwing up the Aeonic Comics uh, link, but tell us about where people can find it, where they can find you folks online. Uh, the, the, give us your plugs. You can find us on Aeonic, Aeonic Comics on Instagram as well. We're working on a website now, too, but those are the main places that you can find us. And you can find me on Instagram while I should be linked in the description of the Aeonic page as well. And, uh, you know, lately I, I've been doing memeanalysis.com. Oh. I think uh, perhaps a more exciting, structured way to explore the work that I've been doing without needing to, to sit and watch a YouTube video. Hmm. And uh, I should clarify as well, we'll be hearing more about uh, meme analysis on this very show. Uh, <laughs> Jason, putting you up because look at that banner. Now you mentioned you oh, make comic books. Where can people find those? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can go to my name, uh, jasonmemmel.com, and then uh, slash fight comics. You can also go to fightcomics.ca, and it's just as it sounds, fight, F-I-G-H-T, comics, C-O-M-I-C-S dot com. And then you can read uh, um, some Jack Kirby inspired stuff, some uh, uh, v wide variety of, of work. There's a sci-fi story. There's um, there's bare knuckle boxing in Frontier Calgary. Um, uh, very little Gnostic in, uh, uh, intentional stuff there. So maybe if Fight Comics Volume 3, we'll have to change that. But uh, yeah, check it out. And hey, John, what's your plugs? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm taking the out of summer off, uh, but normally every Sunday morning I have open secular, psycholo psychological based uh, uh, mindfulness meditation, you know, whatever you call it, not specifically religious um, <laughs> meditation, which is uh, my other job, uh, the meditation coach and freelance writer. And uh, you can. It is both in person and online. So if you're not in the Montreal area, then you can join us online. We set up the webcam. That's going to be starting again in the fall. Uh, and yeah, that's my plug. Um, okay. Uh, with my big fat head, bring everybody back for those watching the YouTube video. Hey, on a comics, <laughs> it's been amazing. Thanks so much for joining us. Everybody go out and buy a copy, buy 10 copies uh, of, of the first two issues, which are now available. <laughs> <laughs> okay, goodbye everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.